Okay, guys. Just to show you uh, one result of uh, our priority setting in Madagascar, using uh, Marksan but not Sonisha. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you see that the result is in square. It shows the place. It's not the site itself, but it shows where should be the place for best uh, conserving existing uh, data available mm -hmm. uh, features, mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. So this is what the software uh, shown as a, as a result. But why we show this to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry? They took out this part in green and they said no, this should be for logging. You know? mm -hmm. Because they said uh, we don't want everything to be conserved. We need some forest to be uh, part of uh, logging. So they said yes. Why? Because for the first time we show some uh, different solutions. You know, and in that case, they, they, they think that we can play mm -hmm. with the data. You can show what solution is best for you yeah. and not for them. Yeah, not for them. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they said, uh, so you, you guys can play. So why not to pick this <laughs> as a, uh, for login? Mm -hmm. And you know, this, uh, this is tricky because uh, when you explain to people the result, uh, don't show you said it should be transparent, but mm -hmm. I think it's <laughs> it's somehow not really transparent uh, uh -huh. in terms of results. But just explain how can you, well, what, what data uh -huh. available and where, and they want just one map for protected areas, and that's it. Not the solution. We can use this, this, this based mm -hmm. on the solution. In that case, they say that you can play. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you can play, so. Why not? Just pick this, and it was drawn on a, on a map, you know, in uh -huh. a, on a Adobe uh, Photoshop, Photoshop Adobe. So they just show this will be for logging, for logging. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's their decision, but it's not us. We just give the tools. Yeah. This is one example of uh, how to communicate uh -huh. because it's very very dangerous sometimes. Yeah, thank you, Timmy. Yeah, this could be very difficult because it, it should be transparent in a way that if you run all the analysis again with the same data using the same approach, you should get to the same result or a very similar one. That's what I would mean by transparency, but uh, thank you. Of course, uh, you have this kind of communication problem because sometimes it is actually difficult to explain what is happening. And this will happen. I mean, they, people will look at the map and they can kind of mis have a misinterpretation of results and they can just do that. Like, no, that area is not good for conservation. The, the good thing about uh, conservation plan is that you can have in this information, you can just block that area and say, we're not going to, to have any action here because it's not no good for conservation and the government's telling me this, they want this for another kind of action like um, sustainable logging. Okay, so we just remove that area from, from our plan and then we run another analysis that's trying to, to compensate that loss in another part of the country. That's, that's the good thing about it. And that is why it's very good to have some, the ability to produce fast solutions because sometimes you have a two hour meeting or four hour workshop with these guys and you have to rerun all the analysis again uh, there because the, you, you only be able to get to them again, I don't know, three months, four months from now. So that's the good thing. But that will happen. And this kind of conflict happens every time. The good thing is when you have the possibility of, of being with these guys, with decision makers, you can tell them that you were there to help. We need to find some kind of solution. We are here to help. We have a problem with this map. I can do another map. We can try to figure out a way. But that could be difficult. And decision makers are so uh, interested in having one solution. 
That's true. So when you give, when you give them many solutions or a portfolio of solutions, they just get lost. They look at there and say, this, I, I, okay, that's pretty nice, but I want one solution. Where should I place this area? Where should I put the money to protect it there, okay? And this is one of the discussions between heuristic and stochastic uh, solutions in conservation planning because heuristic solutions just give you one solution. You're not sure if this is the, the best way, mathematical way to solve the problem, but you just get one solution. And if you're using kind of stochastic approach, you have many solutions, then you usually combine all these solutions and have some kind of relative importance of that place uh, in combined solutions. What we call frequency of selection, maybe uh, some, some people call it irreplaceability. That's how important that area will be. But if you then exclude an area, other areas will become important. And that's the thing. But of course, there will be a trade-off sometime that you actually have an area that is so important because it holds, for example, an endemic species that you just can't uh, uh, exclude that area. And that will be a real conflict between biodiversity interests and other economic or social and developing interest. In. And then you just have to discuss. That's the thing. The biologists don't have the answers. Politicians don't have the answer. You really need to talk and, and get everybody involved in trying to find a solution that will be good to everybody. Maybe not the best solution you wanted to, but the, the possible solution. And that will be, the, will be much better than doing nothing. Okay, so got to find this. Thank you, Dimbi. Anyone more? Maybe you? Go <laughs> here for the um, microphone. Okay. <laughs> good. <coughs> okay. In the city of Cape Town, we were quite lucky in that we had a lot of data, um, but with that comes a lot of processing of data, mm -hmm. um, and we particularly used marks, Marksan, and C plan to come up with what we define as the biodiversity network. So it's, a, it's priority sites for conservation across Cape Town based on national targets. Mm -hmm. um, what we found, particularly at a local level, is we had to prioritize a factor in competing land use. So if there were other applications for land that we felt was important for conservation, but agriculture had shown an interest in, or housing had shown an interest in, um, we couldn't take that into our analyses necessarily because it's very difficult politically to motivate for those portions of land. Mm -hmm. So where we had that information, we had to prioritize those sections out or not select them. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing which was quite labor intense is, is the entire city was mapped using aerial photography and then ground truth to see if what you're seeing on the ground matched what you were mapping mm -hmm. from aerial photography. Mm -hmm. um, and at a local level, and you, you'll probably find that at any, even at a country level where there's a lot of development or focus on development, we're rerunning this process every year because you're then having to map out new transformed areas and adjust your targets and adjust your areas. Mm -hmm. So it's a very short nutshell, but mm -hmm. it's, I don't think these kinds of tools is a once off and you've these are your targets. You're always having to go back and go, can we still meet those targets? Do we have to readjust our thinking or our plans or our budgets mm -hmm. accordingly? Great. So you guys are doing a great job. Uh, that's exactly what you, you should be doing. So you have to monitor the system you're trying to apply to and have to check every year. That's very good. What is happening? What land transformations have occurred? Then you have to adapt. It's a kind of adaptive system. You have to be running this uh, every, every from time for time to to get the best answer. And again, so the peers here, you have this kind of data uncertainty. You're using aerial photography and don't know if if your action looking in a photograph would be here. This is one kind of uncertainty. And then you have uh, this problem of dynamics. Land use is changing, land is changing, and, and you should be 
all the time looking at the targets and, uh, and revising your targets and looking if, you, if you're actually achieving that targets in that plan. Then you have to turn out the plan and, and work out the plan so it can be different and achieve the targets again. It's a pretty much uh, difficult but interesting game at the end. Anyone else? Yeah, I, just to add, uh, one to, I think uh, from Madagascar, I got a good example. I think the biggest challenge in conservation planning in our case, and maybe probably much of Africa, is in how to balance interests. Because then you have different people that you want to work with. The plan must be made by people that will eventually implement it and see it uh, yielding the results. But each of us has their own interest at a given time. Now, bringing all these interests on board becomes a challenge. And I'll just give an example that from a politician's point of view, in our country, for example, I was just talking about this over break tea, mm -hmm. that we had a forest in the center of Uganda, which was of a lot of interest because it had these very unique bad uh, sites that are very important in our setting and it had it was there was interest in making it uh, a special area for conservation of birds mm -hmm. but then it also happened to be close to a big sugarcane plantation which actually serves almost the sugar for the country and there was this plan to expand the sugarcane plantation and from a politician's point of view importing sugar from the next country is more expensive than having to clear one small forest because for a politician it's a small forest to conservation mm -hmm. it could be probably the biggest mm -hmm. <laughs> now to, to tell a politician that put aside your interest and let us look at conservation is a big challenge mm -hmm. and even becomes a bigger challenge in our case where valuing uh, biodiversity is a challenge because you cannot easily place a value that is acceptable to what you want to protect. Mm -hmm. The Uganda cranes is a special bird in our country. It's like the symbol of the country. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a site where they do breeding, but you cannot translate that into money and convince a politician that we shouldn't clear this forest because it's a breeding site for the Uganda cranes. Mm -hmm. And now you, you can see because for politicians understand money and you cannot easily attach a monetary value to all these conservations. Some of these values are not current, they could be in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the biggest challenge today, balancing interests and being able to get values that are justifiable to mm -hmm. all of us to believe that conserving a place is better than maybe putting a new maybe national place for people to play or something else. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest challenge that I've seen in our case. Mm -hmm. And it even becomes very tricky if what you're talking about is very small. And I'll just give an example. If you're dealing with soil organisms for that case, to tell a politician that this is a place that is going to be producing the best earthworms that will go feeding God. Uh -huh. It doesn't make sense to them because not many of our people understand the science of yeah. how the ecosystems uh -huh. work. So that has really been uh -huh. a challenge. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So it is, it is very difficult and it is so multidisciplinary. Then you have to do your work as a biologist, for example, and tell them what, what is the importance of earthworms or something like this. They would just don't get it because who cares about these little animals? And it's pretty, diffi pretty difficult. And perhaps this is actually the, the, the most uh, difficult part. Balancing competing interest is very complicated and it's very complex because you know, people want what they want. And you have people wanting different things and need to, to balance all this. We had, in Brazil, just had a problem like this. Uh, we reformulated all of our forest act and we have had some huge discussions there. Academia was not happy because uh, scientists were not heard at the right moment. So we have the big pressure for the agricultural sector telling that we are too conservative, we're preserving much more than it was needed for to keep ecosystem services and something like this. And it was a kind of a battle. So we were discussing with these guys and then comes political will and political pressures and Brazil uh, has a, a big program of sugarcane production and ethanol, that's our fuel that comes from sugarcane. So 
it is very difficult to say that to, to a private landowner that he can't just burn the forest down to, to have sugar. And he will say to you, oh, but that's what the country wants. You know, the Brazilian wants that. We have, we have this huge program and helping Brazil to achieve his international targets. And you were saying that I can't do that. And it's very complicated. Uh, so we have changed our legislation uh, on that. Uh, scientists were not happy about that, and the rural and agricultural sector is not. But we, we got into some sort of consensus. Uh, the biodiversity uh, lose, has lost uh, this battle, but you know, we we'll reach that consensus, not the best one, but it is a consensus, and it's very complicated to reach uh, this kind of thing. So, uh, the thing is, things will be very good if you could just talk with people and they understand what you're saying and give any proper value to biodiversity, but they won't. They will not do that, and you know, you need to, to keep talking. You have to do uh, your job, you know, talk with people, convince people. Uh, uh, make them understand that biodiversity is, is important. It's not that uh, uh, it's not a balance. You have you have economic growth and biodiversity. You cannot have economic growth without biodiversity, and they have to understand that. But sometimes it's very complicated to get there. Just one thing I remembered, and, it, and it's if if someone's kind of starting down this road, it's a caution. Um, in, in setting our biodiversity network, we kind of went, okay, those are the formally protected areas and you map around them and they're green and you, you assume that they contribute to conservation targets. What we never did, and we're still in process of doing it, is ground truth the reality of the reserve because mm -hmm. a lot of the time our national parks, our reserves, have quite a lot of infrastructure on them which don't contribute to targets and need quite a lot of restoration because mm -hmm. by default we ended up with these areas historically they were areas that were previously farmed and were no longer viable or they were mm -hmm. mountains or they were wetlands that no one could build on so mm -hmm. a lot of transformation went on so it's, it's just a caution if someone's you know at the beginning of it don't make the mistake of just going well that's a protected area and it you're assuming it's got 100% coverage of veg and it's in good condition and it contributes to your national targets because mm -hmm. it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good tip. Okay, guys, thank you for sharing this.